Monero is a privacy-focused cryptocurrency. Released in 2014, an absolute epoch in the crypto world, it's arguably achieved what Bitcoin set out to do. It has created digital cash, which is untraceable and untrackable. It's like the cash notes in your pocket. The word Monero comes from the Esperanto word for coin. And without further ado, Benavon and Kioi. Welcome everybody to Brokenomics. My name is Zach and I'll be going through Monero in this video. As many of you know, Satoshi Nakamoto was the creator of Bitcoin, and that person or group of people decided to keep themselves anonymous. This is the same for Monero. It was a combination of many people's work to create it. Having such anonymity in the founders of large crypto projects is quite rare, as many are just hype men. I'm looking at you, Justin Sun. The crypto market is the Wild West. It's full of snake oil skin salesmen, only too happy to take your money. So it's rare to find integrity and virtue. Ricardo Spangeli, or Fluffy Pony, was the lead maintainer of the Monero network for many years. And it's nice to have a lead developer put his hand up and call out what he believes is bullshit. Back in September 2013, an unheard group of developers called CryptoNote released a white paper about a new protocol by the same name. As a side note, I'd encourage you all to read white papers, not just a corporate branded website. White papers are where the real meat is. It's where you find out what projects are doing differently on a fundamental level. There are like eight cryptos out there out of, I don't know, maybe 3,000 that are actually doing something that's distinguishable from the others. Then in November 2013, they released code, published a GitHub for this new coin called Whitecoin. What was super interesting was this code wasn't a fork on Bitcoin's code, like almost all coins at the time, but rather a brand new code base. We'll fast forward to March 2014, the rest of the code is on GitHub, and it was discovered by a Bitcoin Talk user called Thankful for Today. The community was generated and there was a bit of hype garnered. It was then discovered that 80% of Bitcoins had been pre-mined. Now, I don't need to get Ian on to come explain tokenomics to those numbers, do I? To cut a long story short, Bitcoin was forked. Thankful for today, was kicked to the side. The community took over the fork, named it Monero, and it became the leader of the privacy coin, and it remains so today. Monero shows the power of a community. It, like Bitcoin, doesn't have a definitive founder or leader, or even a single point of failure. It began its life as a scam, but perhaps... It could become one of the most powerful weapons for us, you and me, to take back our financial privacy. Why do you think privacy matters? Well, Mr. Snowden gave up his cushy life in Hawaii, his six-figure salary, his life essentially, to make this point. Arguing that you don't care about the right to privacy because you've nothing to hide is no different than saying you don't care about free speech because you've nothing to say. Bitcoin and blockchain are great for corporations and governments because these entities need more transparency. But us... Me and you, yes, the person watching this video, we already have an Orwellian surveillance device in our pocket. We are the ones that need more individual privacy, and Monero can provide that. Hal Finley, the first person to receive Bitcoin, and in my opinion, probably Satoshi himself, took a whole 11 days to figure out that Bitcoin needed more privacy. It's too late now for Bitcoin, and in a way, it doesn't really matter, because we have Monero. People forget that Bitcoin isn't private, it isn't anonymous, it isn't even close. Every single transaction in the history of Bitcoin is recorded and it's put onto the blockchain. A chain of blocks, get it? If the blockchain is public, it's observable and the IRS are coming for you and so are the governments in your country. With public blockchains, there's nowhere to hide. Companies like Chain Analysis are finding ways to analyze blockchains to try and put names to addresses. They're the first and there will be others after them. Fungibility is when two units can be substituted for one another. I could swap this 50 euro bill in my wallet for the 50 euro bill in yours and it would be the same except for the unique IDs on each, so it's not completely fungible. Gold would be another good example. One ounce of gold is equal to another. If you owned a thousand gallons of oil, it would mean that you need to receive the exact gallon that you originally held. You need to receive the same amount of oil because it holds the same value. The same could be said for a can of Coke. One thing I love about Coke is the bum on the street can't get a better can of Coke than the President of the United States. 
Anyway, Bitcoin isn't fungible. A singular Bitcoin can be traced through the blockchain from its creation. Therefore, if it's been used for an illegal purpose in the past, it's tainted and could mean that some businesses might not accept it. Currently, there's some large Bitcoin companies blocking, suspending and closing accounts because they've received Bitcoin used in online gambling or other purposes that they have deemed unsavory. Who gives them that right? With Bitcoin, you can follow the Bitcoin from address to address, meaning that you can tell if certain Bitcoins were involved in a crime. If you send some Bitcoin from a dark net market to Coinbase, just wait and see how quickly your account will be flagged and shut down, and the three letter agencies will put your name on a list, or even worse, knock at your door. This creates a two tiered system within Bitcoin. The person the receiving the Bitcoin might not want this tainted coin, therefore, Bitcoin is not fungible. Monero, much like cash equivalents of US dollars and euros, doesn't have a transaction history associated with it. It's impossible to link one Monero to its past transaction and its history. This is thanks to some very clever features, which I'll now go into. In Bitcoin, you have a public and a private key. The public key is an address that everybody can see. It is the receiver's address you use when you want to send Bitcoins. The private key unlocks and proves that he owned the Bitcoin associated with that address. In, Amero, in Monero, we have stealth addresses, and they're concerned with the receiver of the Monero's privacy. They allow and require the sender to create one-time addresses for every transaction. There's also one-time destination public keys that are only spendable by the receiver, and only the receiver is able to detect where they are on the blockchain. In Monero, you have a private view key, which lets you see every incoming transaction for that address, and a private spend key, which is used to sign Monero transactions. Public address is the address for receiving payments in Monero, but not the address for viewing them. That's what the view key is for. So Alice has sent Monero to Bob, but an outside observer can never link Bob's wallet address to him by just looking at the blockchain, whereas they can with Bitcoin. Stealth addresses are only concerned with the receiver's privacy, aka Bob. Ring signatures help the sender, Alice, keep herself hidden. Ring signatures are a type of digital signature where a group of signers are fused together via the Monero algorithm to produce a distinctive signature that authorizes a transaction. The non-signers are past transaction signers pulled from the blockchain and they act as decoys. All of these signatures, these outputs, so to speak, come together to make up the inputs of a transaction. So, to a snooping third party like a government or a marketing firm or even a blockchain analyst company, all of these inputs look equally likely to be the outputs of the transaction. Ring CTs use a similar concept to ring signatures, except it's for hiding transaction amounts, because the amount in transaction can help identify you. This is the amount of Monero being sent between Alice and Bob. Scalability has been a problem with Bitcoin before. It increases the cost of transaction. It causes huge fees. Ethereum is having this problem at, the, at this very moment. The current size per block for Bitcoin is one megabyte. Monero, on the other hand, uses a free block size mechanism with no preset limit. Monero solves the potential problem of malicious miners clogging up the network by taking the median of the last 100 blocks. If the next block is greater than the median, there's a penalty for the miners and the reward is pre reduced proportionally. This allows the block size to grow and contract based on the transaction volume. Initially, you can mine Bitcoin with a CPU. You could do it on your home computer. It was then GPU, which are more common in gaming PCs, and finally, it was ASAC miners, application-specific integrated circuits. These were specifically designed for mining Bitcoin. Bitcoin then became impossible for hobbyists, and mining farms full of ASAC miners with tens of thousands of machines began to pop up all over the world in far from places like China, creating centralized points in an entity that prides itself in its decentralization. Monero, on the other hand, used random exa as an ASAC resistance and CPU-friendly proof-of-work algorithm. Then since 2019, it has used CryptoNight, which also severely de-incentivize ASIC miners and even GPUs. This is all an attempt to create a truly decentralized network. However, it must be said, three mining pools make up over 60% of the Monero network. Bitcoin will eventually have 21 million coins and a block halving every two and a half, 
two and a bit years or so. There's currently 18.7 million Bitcoins in existence. However, there must be millions of them lost forever, like those that are lost in a dump in Wales. The last Bitcoin will be mined in 2140 or thereabouts. Currently, there's like 17 and a half, 18 million XRM in circulation. Unlike most cryptocurrencies, there's no preset total limit of Monero. Instead, developers chose to increase the total amount by 0.87% in the first year, with each year following this percentage lowers. At the current rate, it will take about 115 years before Monero doubles its current supply. Monero will always have a market. It is now the cryptocurrency of choice for the dark web, having taken Bitcoin's crown. It will also become the cryptocurrency of choice for hackers to demand a ransom in. In 2017, after the WannaCry incident, hackers converted their Bitcoin proceeds into Monero. Atomic swaps are going to change the game. An atomic swap is a protocol by which two different cryptocurrencies on two different blockchains can be exchanged in a trustless manner with no intermediary, no middleman. This means that if someone wants to exchange cryptocurrency A, Bitcoin, for cryptocurrency B, Monero, they'd be able to do it without any exchange, centralized or decentralized. As of May 30th, 2021, Comet Network, an Australian-based R&D group, announced that atomic swaps are live on its mainnet between Monero and Bitcoin. This is where you can see a lot of Bitcoin moving from an observable public blockchain to a hidden blockchain in Monero. It is for this main reason and for all the other reasons cited in this video that I urge you to educate yourself on Monero and seriously consider the value it brings to the cryptocurrency world and the world at large. Thanks very much. Bitcoin began. Why do you think privacy matters? Well, Mr. Snowden gave up his coffee.